All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, so my name is Will. I work at Foundation DB. If you haven't heard of us, we make a scalable and fault-tolerant database with ACID transactions. I'm not here to talk about that today, though. Uh, instead, I'm going to talk about simulation testing and why it might make your life easier. So I want to start with an observation, which I hope everybody here agrees with, which is that debugging distributed systems is preferable to sticking a fork in your eye. Uh, <laughs> but not that preferable. It's actually, like, it's actually surprisingly close. Um, and people will tell you a lot of reasons why this is true. Uh, one of the most common ones I hear is it's because they're complicated. And I'll, I'll grant that it's true, they are complicated. And debugging complicated stuff is harder than debugging simple stuff. But I want to propose that this is not the real reason why they're really hard to debug. Um, so to, to look at the real reason, let's look at a super simple example. So we've got a server on the left here and a server on the right here. And the server on the right is going to send a packet to the server on the left. And this is a non-item potent packet. That means if it gets received twice, it has a different effect than if it gets received once. And the server on the left has a bug in it, which is it doesn't check how many times the packet's been received. But you know, this bug is never manifested. It's asymptomatic because you know, networks always work, right? So server on the right sends a packet, and it gets lost in a time warp because ne networks are mysterious. You know, Somebody misconfigured a switch. Some berserk router sent it to China. Um, and sooner or later, like a retry happens, like you hope a distributed system would do. And then this packet emerges from the time warp, and everything catches fire and explodes. You lose your data. Everything's a disaster. And you're like, oh, goody, I get to debug this now. So you set everything up again, and you run your system again, and this time, it works fine. And you're like, OK, I've got to get it to crash again so I can debug it. So you set it up again, and it works fine. And it may just keep working fine, because this random network, this network condition here, was super transient and super rare and dependent on ridiculously precise timings. Um, you can never get it to show up again. It is going to show up again, probably on a client site, right? Um, but you can't make it happen. You can't track down the bug. And even worse, once you think you've fixed the bug, you can't verify that you've actually fixed it. So one more example, uh, just to build our intuition here, right? Same setup, server on the left, server on the right. Server on the right's going to send two packets. It sends them like in order, packet A and then packet B. It's not in its contract that it has to send them in that order. It's just like we're normal human beings, right? So when we program sending two packets, we type like send A, then send B. We don't type, you know, roll a die, 50% chance, send A, send B, then 50% chance, send B, send A. That's not what humans do. Uh, so it just always happens to send them A and then B. Well, unfortunately, the server on the left thought that that was the contract, thought that that always did happen. Well, you see where this is going now. A gets lost in a time warp, B shows up first, then A, then the world explodes. Uh, good luck ever debugging this. So the real, so the, 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 I mean, the surface level problem is that we have no repeatability in our debugging. The real problem is that the messy, dirty universe has intruded on our beautiful, pristine land of pure functions, right? Like, the execution history of this system is not a pure function of its inputs. There's a source of entropy, a source of randomness, which you do not control, which is the network. Um, this problem is especially apparent in distributed systems, but you can get the same kinds of bugs, just replace all the words uh, with like threads or disks or you name it. Um, so, so this is the problem. And this was like a super bad problem for us because we make a distributed database that tries to provide a meaningful guarantee to its users. Um, ACID is not a property of a system that emerges by accident, right? <laughs> there, there are a lot of ways of getting that wrong, a lot more ways of getting it wrong than getting it right. And what's really scary is that there are many more ways of getting it right and then having it fail as soon as something unexpected happens than there are of getting it right and having it stick and be right. The second problem is that we make a database. Like if we just made a web server or a cache or something, we'd be like, whatever, dude, nuke the VM, start a new one. <laughs> Turns out people aren't like philosophical like that about their data. Um, I don't know why. They get really upset when you tell them to do that. So we basically decided that if we couldn't solve this problem, we shouldn't even bother trying to build a database. Um, so we did solve the problem. 
So the thing that the company did was we didn't write a database. We started by writing a simulation of a database, a totally deterministic simulation. And then once we'd exhaustively debugged that, we were like, okay, now we can write a database, which is just that plus talking on networks and talking to disks for real. Um, for actually a couple years, there was no database. There was just a simulation. That probably sounds totally insane. I promise you it's more insane than you think it is. Um, we're talking about simulating not just a process, but an entire network of communicating processes, plus all the interactions they have with their environment, with disks, with OSs, with networks, all within a single virtual process, or sorry, a single physical process, many virtual processes. Um, that sucks, it's really hard to do. It turns out to create some real software engineering challenges. So let me run through those quickly, sort of what they are in theory, and then I'll talk about how we address them and how you might address them. Um, the first is you need something that I'm gonna call single-threaded pseudo-concurrency. It's a bit of a mouthful, so let me unpack that. This, the con I mean, like conceptually, right, like you're trying to simulate many, many different things all happening at the same time, plus all the machinery around them that's making them think they're talking to each other. Uh, so you're gonna need something that looks a little bit like concurrency. It can't actually be concurrent, though, because if it were actually concurrent, you would now have a source of non-determinism, which we just like sought to extirpate, right? Um, like I just said, like all these problems happen again with threads. So we can't do it with threads. We can't do it in more than one process. We have to do it in one process. It's really easy in some languages. It was really hard in the one we picked. Um, the next thing you need is a simulated implementation of all the ways in which your processes can talk to the rest of the universe. I think it's pretty clear why you need that. Basically, all that randomness, all that entropy needs to be randomness and entropy that you put there on purpose. And then the last thing you need Sounds kind of dumb, but the processes you're simulating themselves need to actually be deterministic. And it, you know, if you get one and two right, three is usually not that bad, but there's some ways of shooting yourself in the foot here, so I'll talk about those. Um, right, so, so the way we tackled one was maybe a little bit insane. Uh, we knew that we couldn't do this with threads for the reasons I've already said. Coroutines have their own issues. That basically left callbacks. And we also knew that we wanted to write in C++ because, you know, it's fast. So, you know, the problem here, this is a little bit of a dilemma because callbacks plus C++ is like a nightmarish hellscape. Um, it was not something that we wanted to deal with. What we needed were higher level primitives, um, some abstractions that we could actually reason about, that we could actually write and actually read. So the way we did this was we created something called Flow which is sort of halfway between a library and a new language. Um, it's a syntactic extension to C++, which lets you use actor model concurrency um, with the physical implementation totally single-threaded, entirely in callbacks. Um, that's done via a sort of, scare quotes, compilation step. Um, you could call it a pre-processing step. I don't know. It's a compiler whose target is C++, let's say that. Um, so it lets you write things like this. This is like the simplest possible actor you could write, I guess. It's like an asynchronous adder. It takes a future float and a float. It waits for the future to become ready. It returns the sum. Uh, there's two things you should immediately notice about this. The first is that this actor keyword is not C++. You feed that into your compiler, it'll yell at you. Um, this tells the flow compiler that what follows is an actor definition, and it should treat it as an actor and generate an actor from this. Uh, the second thing you might notice here is that this return type is wrong, right? It's declared to return a future float, but this sure looks like it's just returning a plain ordinary float. That's because this function body is not going to appear anywhere in your program. It's almost like declarative. You're telling the actor compiler what you want to have happen. What's actually going to happen is it's going to generate uh, a new function and a new class. And the function is immediately going to return a future which will become ready as soon as the actor is done executing and as soon as everything asynchronous is finished happening. Um, here's a tiny, tiny amount of the generated code that it produces. So the async add function gets redefined, or defined for the first time. It gets constant modifiers stuck on its parameters. Those parameters get passed into the constructor of a class, which is totally generated. Um, that class returns immediately. Um, and the implementation of the actor gets broken up across methods in the class. So every time there was one of these like wait statements where we're waiting for some asynchronous process to terminate, 
that means a function in the class is going to end. And it's going to set a callback on that future. And the callback is going to point to the next part of the actor. And then it's going to yield immediately to a centralized scheduler so that the rest of your program can continue running. Um, at the very end, uh, like here's some callback junk it generated. Uh, at the very end, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fulfill that future that you are holding with the promise that it holds on to. And then it destroys itself and cleans itself up and blah, blah, blah. Um, and yeah, so it's pretty nice. You get to write actors. You, know, you get to write this. But it all happens in one thread. And it can still be super asynchronous. Uh, and it's also pretty fast. So here are some numbers that you should take with a gigantic grain of salt. Um, this is a benchmark called the Ring benchmark. It was invented by that guy who just, uh, who just gave the previous talk, Joe Armstrong. Uh, basically, you get a ring of actors, n of them, and they're all lined up in a big ring, and they pass a message one to the other, and it goes all the way around the ring, and you do that m times. And these were some numbers. So uh, two reasons why you basically shouldn't believe this. One is that the numbers that weren't flow were numbers that other people ran that we found on the internet. And we think they probably did a good job running their own systems, but we have no idea. Um, the second reason is that it's kind of a simplistic benchmark. I hope Jar Joe Armstrong's not here, is he? Okay, it's kind of a dumb benchmark. Like, <laughs> like I mean, it doesn't, I mean, it's an okay benchmark, but it doesn't actually model like what real distributed actor systems do very much. Um, and in fact, we found that as you make actors more and more complicated and have like way more asynchronicity in the body of the actors, flow's relative advantage decreases considerably. Um, although we don't have nice numbers from other people to compare that against. So that's one reason why we're currently writing flow two, uh, to try and, try and make that a little faster. But anyway, um, assuming you're not using C++, you don't have to do anything near that crazy, but we did. Um, so the next thing, conversely, is something that might be hard for most of you, but was super easy for us. So we already had a multi-platform program. So we had nice like abstracted out interfaces for talking to disks, talking to networks, et cetera, et cetera. And so we could just drop in a new implementation right next to those. So you've got like your Unix network code and your Windows networking code. And so we added some simulated networking code. Um, that was not too bad. And so if it's a simulated network, then like when you try and make a network connection, instead of actually making a network connection, it initializes a C++ class, which has got some internal state and some buffers. And like if somebody sends to it, then it's going to wait for a little while to simulate latency on the setting, sending side. It's going to wait for a little while to simulate latency on the receiving side. Then it's going to copy some bytes around. And then it's going to make the receiver know that like there's some bytes available. Um, so one kind of cool thing here in the read method, and I'm going to talk a lot more about this later, is there's this call here to roll random close. And that gets into sort of the fun part of this talk, uh, which is how we try to turn up bugs. So this is just a, a taste. Basically, every time you try and read from the simulated network, there's a chance that something terrible will happen. So we roll a random number. And if you get unlucky, then we roll some more random numbers. And then there's a chance that your peer is just going to close the connection. There's a chance that you're just going to close the connection. There's a chance that you don't know what happened. And the connection just fails, and you receive an error when you try and read. Um, so this is like how we try to smoke out any code in our system that might have been assuming the network was reliable, which is a very foolish thing to assume. Um, but this is just the start. It gets a lot more fun. So then the last thing you need is determinism. Uh, this sounds brain dead easy, right? Like, like we don't like usually try and write our processes to be non-deterministic. Nevertheless, it shows up all the time. So the obvious example is if you ever have a random number in your program. So for instance, in exponential backoff, we use random numbers. Uh, then you're going to have to make sure that that random number comes from a pseudo random number generator, which you control, which you seeded. And then the seed of that random number generator becomes part of the input of the program. right? So, so that's fine. OK, it's a little weird, but we can do that. Have you ever checked the time in an if statement? If so, your program just became non-deterministic. Have you ever checked how much disk space you have free? Like, again, like non-deterministic now. Like, running it two different times uh, could produce totally different execution histories. Um, our programmers are trained to recognize this stuff and to try and avoid it. And we still screw it up all the time, uh, really all the time. 
And that's why we do one last thing, which is some small percentage of our simulation runs, I think right now about 1%, we actually run them twice. And then we check, uh, one, run them twice with the exact same inputs, mind you. So the exact same things happen in the exact same sequence. And at the very end, we check those random number generators I mentioned and see what the next random number it would have generated would have been. And if those don't match exactly, we know there was a determinism failure and we go track that down. So this is obviously not an exhaustive check. You can break determinism and this will still work, um, but it guarantees that you'll find those problems sooner rather than later. Um, okay, so you get three things that behave like that and you roll them together, not necessarily in the way that we did. Again, you may not be using C++, in which case this is probably a lot easier. Um, and you have something which can take a network of interacting processes uh, and simulate them together in a totally, totally deterministic way. So uh, that's where the fun begins. Um, because the fun part is now we need to find bugs. And so the way we do that is, is, is with these test files. And these test files declare two types of things. Um, one is a set of stuff that the system is going to try and achieve. That's this up here. And one, the rest is a set of stuff that's going to try to prevent it from achieving that. So in this case, we've declared that we're going to try and do a cycle test. A cycle test is where we insert a ring of keys and values into the database, so they're each pointing to the next one, like value one's pointing to key two, so on. And then we begin executing transactions concurrently, uh, in this case, 1,000 per second. And they're all going to run at the same time. And each transaction is going to mutate the keys and values in the database. And it's going to do that subject to a constraint, which is that each transaction taken as a whole preserves the ring. It may reorder stuff, it may move stuff around, but the ring as a whole will stay intact. Um, so this is super cool because it gives us an invariant that we can check at the, ease, at the end that's super easy to tell whether ACID was violated, right? So like if there was an atomicity failure, one of those transactions would partially execute and the ring would be broken. Or if some of these transactions clobbered each other and there was a lack of isolation, again, the ring would break or it would get shorter or get longer or something. So that's just like a cool, a cool like easy way of telling if there was a failure. Um, that is not of the, like, you know, it crashed kind. Um, and then the last thing you'll note in that cycle definition is that we're only expecting to complete 1% of these. And that's because of the rest of the file. Uh, so, so the next thing here is we're going to do some random clogging. That's where we take these simulated network connections, like the ones I showed you, and at random, or pseudo-randomly, deterministically, next time it'll happen the exact same way if you run it with the same inputs, we're just going to stop them and prevent them from sending or receiving packets try and flush out things of the sort that you saw in that very first slide. Um, this clogging has the swizzle flag set. Swizzling is sort of like clogging plus plus, I guess. It's uh, where you take a, a subset of the network connections and you stop them like on a rolling basis, and then you bring them back up in reverse order. And for reasons that we totally don't understand, this is better at finding bugs than normal clogging. Uh, it's kind of scary. So the next, thing, the next thing we do here is, uh, is, called, is called attrition in this test. Attrition is just powering stuff off. Sometimes we power stuff back on. In this case, we do. We're going to kill 10 machines total over the course of the test, and we're going to leave three on at any given time. So hopefully, if there's some power safety problem, that'll turn it up. Uh, the last one here is actually by far the most evil, even though it looks kind of innocuous. <laughs> Sometime in those 30 seconds, we're going to change the configuration of the database. And uh, this particular configuration change is designed to provoke a coordination change, which means that the cluster is going to have to execute multi-Paxos, and it's going to be doing that while network connections are randomly clogged, while machines are going down and rebooting left and right, and while it's trying to get 1,000 transactions done per second. So, you know, if there's a bug in our Paxos, hopefully we'll find it. Um, yeah, and we do a crap ton of other stuff, too. Uh, so this one's, like, really nasty. Instead of just killing machines, we sometimes set them in a state where, like, sort of try and simulate them gradually failing. All future system calls have, like, a 1% chance of returning an error. So then the cluster, we get to find out, like, if it's smart about, like, detecting that and, like, quarantining it and destroying it before it infects everything else. Um, it tests graceful shutdown, tests a lot of good stuff like that. Um, we also have, like, a... Uh, our database has a concept of locality. You know, it can be aware of your rack topology or whatever, and of where your WAN links are. 
And so the simulation knows that too. Uh, so we can simulate just you know, killing an entire data center, see if that was really durable. Uh, we also simulate dumb sysadmins, which totally don't exist in the real world. Um, so one thing we can do is just instantly atomically swap the IP addresses of two machines and see what happens. Or we can instantly copy the data files from two computers onto each other and just swap them, just switch their hard drives and see if that results in any data loss. Uh, so that's tons of fun. This is just a random sample. Uh, like one of the most fun parts of my job is thinking up new and creative ways of torturing our database and then implementing that in simulation uh, and it's oodles of fun. So uh, now we get to the basic problem with this whole approach, which is you have some set of machines out there which are diligently chugging through simulations, exploring the space of all possible inputs and the space of all possible failure modes, which as we learned just a second ago is very large, but still you're exploring it and you're hoping that you find the bugs. Um, so the interesting fact is you have customers, hopefully, and your customers are running your distributed systems on buggy, crashy, faily, grossly under-provisioned, totally improperly configured hardware. Um, and they're doing insane things to it, by the way. And PS, if it breaks, it's your fault. Um, so they are also exploring the space of all possible inputs and failure modes. And hopefully, you have many orders of magnitude more customers than you have machines in your test lab. And so the question is, how on earth can you possibly hope to explore that space more quickly than your customers do? Um, another way of thinking about this is you need to find more bugs per CPU hour than the real world uh, by many orders of magnitude, which is hard. So there's a couple ways we try to do that. Um, I'm interested to hear what you all think about this, since it's definitely an ongoing problem. One way we do it is just we make things fail a lot more often, right? So like you saw that our connections drop like pretty regularly. Um, I don't know, in the real world, how often does a disk fail? Like every two or three years if it's under a heavy load or something? We make them fail like every two or three minutes. So that means hopefully if there's a bug in our like disk failure handling code, we have many more disk failures per CPU hour than the real world gets. And so we find it faster than our customers would. Um, Another thing we can do, which is kind of cheating, but that's the name of the game here, is, uh, is speed up time, right? So there's a lot of time when the cluster is just sort of sitting around being quiescent or it's trying to recover from something and there's some hard number of seconds it's waiting for something to happen. Uh, when we're in that kind of a state, we can just speed up time and make many more sim seconds pass per real world second than we did before, so long as we have the computing power on a single core. Um, so that's another trick. Um, okay, so another thing we do is called bugification. That's, that's a, an in-house term, I'm sure everybody else does this, but calls it something else. So the, so the intuition here is, if you remember those first examples I gave you, they were both, the basic problem there was that there was an asymptomatic bug, right? The computer on the left actually didn't understand the contract of the computer on the right. It was always a bug. It just took something exceedingly rare to make it show up. Well, if you have deterministic simulation and you're exploring that space of all possible failures, you know, you hope that it will show up eventually. But wouldn't it be nice if it, you didn't have to wait for something really weird to happen for it to show up? And so the idea here is you do just that thing which I said programmers never do, which is sometimes randomly change what your code does. Um, so in the first example, you might have written something, and Bugify is just a macro, right? It expands to like, do this if you're in simulation with probability something small. Um, and we compute a hash on the line number and stuff. Anyway, um, right, so you would say something like, if bugify, send packet B and then send packet A, just to make sure that any consumer of that interface really understood what that interface did. To make sure that the like, space of things that the interface did was not like a very narrow subspace of the set of things that it could do. Um, so here are just two more examples from our code. You know, sometimes don't send everything you've got ready to send. Here's one where if we're bugifying, we just never send a timeout, you know? Because like timeout might never show up. It would really suck if the other person on the other end of here were counting on that timeout for some reason. And you know, we do this in other ways too. Um, okay, so the last thing relates to one of my favorite topics. It's called the Hearst exponent. Uh, 
which was first described in the 1951 edition of the Transactions of the American Society of Civil Engineers, which I own a copy of because I'm a huge nerd. And it was described in this article, Long-Term Storage Capacity of Reservoirs, by Harris Hurst. So Hurst was a British civil servant who was sent to Egypt to study the dams and reservoirs on the Nile. And he uh, noticed that the previous generation of engineers had designed these dams and reservoirs so that they wouldn't explode unless there was a 100-year flood and they wouldn't run dry unless there was a 100-year drought. Seems pretty sensible. Um, so then Hearst noticed that the 100-year flood and the 100-year drought were happening about once every 15 years. And that was interesting. And what he figured out was that the previous generation of engineers, and we're all going to snicker at this, but don't, because people in finance did this up until 2008, uh, had assumed that every rain or not rain event was an independent trial. And they were totally uncorrelated, right? But of course, this is a total lie. This is not real. Um, in the real world, the probability of rain on Wednesday, given rain on Tuesday, is slightly higher than the probability of rain on Wednesday, you know, full stop. Um, they're not independent at all. And the Hearst exponent is a way of quantifying that lack of independence. So, you know, when you have independent trials like that, what you get is a Gaussian probability distribution, which falls off very, very quickly in the tails. Um, when you take into account the fact that the Hearst exponent could be not one half, you get a broader class of distributions called stable Parisian distributions. Um, and the Hearst exponent is the exact reciprocal of the alpha parameter of these guys. So alpha of two corresponds to a Hearst exponent of one half, which is a Gaussian. But if the Hearst exponent gets bigger than a half, then all of a sudden you have something that's not a Gaussian that has way more space in the tails. Um, that means that high sigma events, or events that naive theory would predict are high sigma, are going to happen way, way, way more often. OK, what on earth does that have to do with distributed systems? The answer is hardware failures are not independent random events. OK, you all know this in your guts, right? Like if a hard drive fails in a rack, what is the first thing you do? Oh my god, check every other hard drive in that rack. Um, it could have been in a bad batch. There could have been some bad maintenance there. There could be a humidity problem in the data center. Like everybody knows this intuitively, even if they don't actually do what it implies all the time. Um, the problem is that multiple cascading failures, which a non-naive approach to statistics tells us are much more likely than a simple naive Gaussian would predict, are among the very, very hardest things to test in real world physical testing. Like getting a whole bunch of hardware all set up to like fail in like some randomly, totally terrible together way is challenging. But in simulation, you can do it really easily. And we do. And we absolutely manipulate the Hearst exponent and try and simulate as many of these multiple cascading failures as we can. Because we know that they're going to happen in the real world a lot. Um, so you put that all together. We estimate we've run the equivalent of trillions of real world CPU hours worth of tests. We can run 5 to 10 million simulation runs per night on our cluster. Um, each one of those simulates an entire cluster behaving anywhere between, I call it five minutes and an hour or two, um, depending on the test. And then plus all that bugification and speeding up time and everything else. And we've been doing this for years. Uh, so we've, we've done a lot of testing. So there's some bad news, though, which is that we've totally broken debugging. Um, so you all already know that stepping through code that is laced and infused with callbacks is horrible. Um, if you were to take a traditional debugging approach to a deterministic simulation of your callback-infused code, that will be much worse. So you're going to have multiple sort of callback-infected monstrosities all interacting, coexisting in the same process that you're attached to, plus all the simulation code around them that's trying to convince them that they're secretly talking to each other. Um, it's insanely challenging. We do have people who are really good at debugging who are able to like step through like two or three levels of the stack doing this, and like we're all in awe. Uh, the rest of us cannot. Um, so what you're left with is basically printf, uh, which sounds pretty horrible and barbaric. 
Uh, and I'll be honest, it is. Um, but it's actually not that bad when you have deterministic simulation and you know that if you rerun the simulation with the exact same inputs, the exact same set of stuff will happen in the exact same order at the exact same times. That lets you put in non-spammy printfs that depend on conditions that you know will be fulfilled next time. It lets you gradually like, work your printfs deeper into something, kind of you know, corner the bug and then kill it. And then you know, once you've killed it, it lets you know that the bug didn't repeat. Although there's a subtlety there that if I have time, I'll get to maybe in questions. Um, OK, so that's cool, but there's still a nightmare case, which is that our simulation is wrong. Uh, there's at least two ways that a simulation can be wrong. One is it's not brutal enough. There is some pattern of failures which can happen in the real world and which does not happen in our simulation. And you know, we don't think that's true, but who the hell knows? Um, networks are weird, scary things. Uh, so that's one problem. Another problem is we may just misunderstand the contracts of the operating systems, right? Like F-sync might mean something different than we thought it did. I actually have a funny story about that. Um, not now, though. Uh, or you know, you're porting to a new platform, and like some system call that you thought you know was given the same name, confusingly enough, actually has a slightly different, slightly different guarantee. Um, that could be a really big problem. Or the OS has a bug, right? That could be a big problem too. You know, the simulation is only as good as our understanding of what the operating systems and the hardware actually do. So to solve both, well, to try and catch both of these kinds of problems with simulation, we have this backup cluster, which we call sinkhole. So sinkhole is um, a bunch of little, little server motherboards. These are like real, they're kind of cute, but they're, they're real server motherboards with ECC RAM and the whole, whole shebang. Um, and they're all hooked up with like Cat5 uh, and through a bunch of switches. And both the switches and the motherboards are all connected to programmable network power supplies. Right? You see, oh, yeah. You see where I'm going. So then we just program these things to turn on and off all night while our database is running um, in the hopes that you know, we'll find something. And what we've found is that network power supplies suck. They burn out after like two days. It's a giant pain in the ass. Then we have to buy more. We've run through hundreds of these things. Um, also, SSDs don't like it when you toggle their power on and off really fast. <laughs> That's a little bit more expensive. Um, we're really proud to say, though, that we've actually never found a bug in our database doing this, uh, which makes us think that simulation is, is doing a pretty good job. I said I never found a bug in our database doing this. Um, we have found bugs in other people's software. Um, so this is the other thing, right, that simulation can't test, and that's a real danger. So software that we didn't write, software that wasn't written in Flow, uh, but that's part of our stack, we cannot test in simulation. So early, early versions of FoundationDB use ZooKeeper for uh, maintaining coordination state. We found a power safety bug in ZooKeeper with a precursor to sinkhole. Um, we reported it. They fixed it. That was awesome. But that experience was so traumatic and kind of scary that we ripped it out of our stack and wrote our own Paxos. That's written in Flow. It runs under simulation. So like now we're like a little more chill about that. Also, deploying Java is a pain. Um, <laughs> This one's kind of funny. So we once did a sinkhole run. We installed our database on all these computers, started them all up and running, and then just like started killing the power left and right. And one of the processes didn't come back up. And we were like, what? That can't happen. Our database is power safe. So we dug into it a little bit, and we found out that the data files had all been durably synced and logged to disk. They were right there. The configuration files for the database were like non-existent or corrupt or something, because apt had not called fsync. Uh, so then the database process came back up. It was like, oh, no configuration file. I must be a new process. Oh, wait, there's data here. Oh, no. And it panicked. Um, so that was, that was fun. OK, I've talked for a long time. Let me, let me wrap up here. Uh, despite all that we're doing, you know, that space of all possible failures is very, very, very large. And so we have to explore it systematically. But there's all kinds of ways in which we fail to do that, because we're humans. So here are just a few of the things that are on our mind. Uh, that we worry about a lot. Um, 
One is, you know, we'd probably feel a lot better if we had the resources to have a couple employees whose job was just to introduce bugs um, and see if they make it through simulation. And then if it does, then that's a bug report against the simulation framework. Um, another thing is more hardware. So like, this is kind of weird. I feel like we've entered like, a new like, phase in the relationship between man and machine. Uh, because if you look at the workflow of one of us, it looks like you make some changes to the program, you recompile, and then you run like 10,000 simulations, see if you did something obviously dumb. And then you hope that if you did something subtly dumb, it'll get caught that night when we run 10 million. That sucks. Running 10,000 simulations takes like a minute or two, or I don't know, a while. Um, you lose your train of thought. It totally breaks your flow. Like this is why one reason why people use interpreted languages, right, is so you can even get rid of that compilation step We've just massively increased cycle time uh, of debugging or of coding. Uh, and that's terrible. So if we added more hardware, that might like, weirdly like, increase the productivity of all of our programmers, which is kind of not how it usually works if you think about it. It's kind of cool. Um, so the, the, this one, this number three, is, is the real nightmare. Um, so if you think about it, say I'm there, I'm writing, writing some, some programming. Uh, and I write a bug, and the bug is caught by the simulation framework. I have just immediately gotten negative feedback. Say I write another bug, and it's not caught by the simulation framework. I get no feedback. So I am slowly but surely being trained to write the kinds of bugs that slip through our simulation framework. <laughs> no, no, like you, you, you're laughing, but this literally keeps our CTO up at night. Um, <laughs> it's, it's horrifying. Um, it sort of bears some resemblance to like antibiotic resistance in bacteria, if you think about it. But like, this is like a real concern. We are training our programmers to defeat the simulation framework. Uh, it's a nightmare. So we're thinking of a bunch of different ways of trying to fix this. One is have two simulation frameworks that operate on different principles and you know, use one of them for day-to-day like, -day debugging and like, development and bounce against it all the time and the other one only use it when we're about to do a release and run millions and millions of simulations on that one and see if any bugs slip through the first one. And this is sort of like how we're trying to defeat antibiotic resistance, right? That's sort of the inspiration. Um, that would be a lot of work, though. So we're trying to think of other ways to do this. Let me know if you have any ideas. Um, then the last thing is just more real-world testing, more stuff like sinkhole. We know we should do this, but we hate it because the hardware is terrible. I have a coworker who jokes that like every part of programming is fun except the parts that interact with networks, disks, or power supplies, and like that's now all he does. Um, you know, you, like yeah, Sinkhole goes through a million programmable power supplies a week. It's terrible. The idea of having that times ten gives me nightmares. But we all know that it's good for us, and like you know, we're at the point where having a little bit more of that would probably give us a really good return. Um, okay, so that's my talk. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. yeah. So what you're doing here is really awesome. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the creative Netflix system in the army. Uh -huh. It's kind of gross stuff. And I was wondering if you've taken a look at that for any inspiration and if you'd also consider kind of taking that approach of like, yeah, this is all fun to do in simulation. Now we're going to run these constructive monkeys in our production code. Yeah, so um, there are definitely pros and cons. Um, to both approaches. I will, I will stop you one second here. All the simulation is run on our production code, if I didn't make that totally clear. So the processes, huh? In the production environment. Yes, that's right. So the only part of our actual production code that's not tested under simulation is the part that actually does the non-simulated talking to disks and networks, which we obviously can't simulate, although we've thought about how we could. Um, right, so, so right, so the benefit of simulation is you can do many, many more different types of things. And you can generally be far more brutal and far more like, calculatedly evil. Like in a real production environment, you don't have like, omnipotent, evil, godlike power to like, stop and start network connections in the most inconvenient possible way. Or to like, do what you know is like, the hard case for Paxos and like, deliberately do that to try and screw with it. Right? Um, on the plus side, like, doing it for real in your for real production environment maybe teaches you something about hardware that you didn't know. Right? So sinkhole is hopefully, I really hope, not anything like what any of our customers run in production. Um, 
maybe there's something wrong with all those disks and, and network cards that our customers run in production that we don't know about. So there's advantages to both approaches. We should probably, we could probably do a lot more of that. Yeah? Uh, I mean, Hearst was a statistician, not an environmentalist or a development economist, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. We're, we're done? All right, sorry. Uh, I'll talk to you after. Thanks.